Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? What good is a budget deal to cut $38 billion from the president's proposals if it will only put us all deeper into debt? Tonight, the budget, the nature of government, and you. Last week, Washington averted a government shutdown with a midnight deal to spend $38 billion less than the president originally wanted to spend in the next six months. This was done the last minute because the Democrats failed to produce a budget for 2011 when they controlled both houses of Congress in 2010. This budget deal came about by the president's view that economic problems generated by too much borrowing and spending can be solved by more borrowing and spending, and the Republican establishment's fear that if they don't redistribute wealth, they might be voted out of office. To paraphrase Macbeth, this is a tale told by idiots, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Does anyone around Washington understand basic economics? Can anyone in Washington tell the truth? The truth is the president will need to borrow another one trillion dollars in order to spend what both parties have just agreed to let him spend. So calling the 38 billion dollar reduction off of a trillion in red ink a victory for fiscal conservatism or for small government just doesn't make any sense. It is a cut from what the president wanted to spend. It still enables him to spend a trillion more than the government receives in revenue. That's where basic economics comes in. America, you may be tired of hearing this, but your government owes $14.3 trillion because presidents now dead and Congress is now long out of office, borrowed against the future, and those bills are now due. They are now due because with economic times difficult, the tax base is shrinking and taxpayers can only afford so much in taxes before the government ruins them. And the government can only afford so much in payments in interest on the debt before we all become enslaved to those from whom the dead presidents and the out of office congresses have borrowed all this money. If most Republicans agree with what I just said, and they claim that they do, how can they possibly agree that we can now borrow another trillion dollars in just the next six months? If we haven't the money or the means to pay back so much as a dollar of the 14.3 trillion we owe, how can we morally borrow another trillion? There was a time when the two political parties stood for different values, but their thirst for power and their enjoyment in exercising it, what St. Augustine called the lust to dominate, has brought these two parties into a collaborative arrangement whereby they pretend to do battle over values. In reality, they accept the same principles, such as the need for war, the desirability of central economic planning, the indispensability of debt, and the wisdom of transferring wealth in order to buy votes. This is indeed a sad state of affairs that leadership in both parties accept these views. Views so antithetical to those of the framers. Views so socialistic in nature. Views so violative of your natural right to do as you wish with your earnings and your property. Views so utterly calculated to deliver us to economic doom as to be called un-American at their core and to constitute a government based in legalized theft. What shall we do? We should encourage every Republican in Congress and the few Democrats who will listen to vote against the president's proposals to allow him to borrow the trillion this year and the 1.7 trillion he wants to borrow next year. Those votes have yet to be taken and there is still a chance the borrowing could stop. And we should force the government, just like we do at home, to live within its means. And if it doesn't, then we should in due time replace it with a government that means what it says when it swears fidelity to the Constitution. Because the majority of these folks in power now 